popping, was popping, was popping, was popping. Welcome, 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 welcome to the real food, to the real big food podcast. Y'all know how I give it up first thing in the morning. I'm recording. The Michael Jordan of recording first thing in the AM. Today is Sunday and I'm up early. You know how I do. So I blast off. Right now, we are going to jump into the segment of the incarceration of Fuquan, a teenager. Yeah, I told y'all back, you know what I'm saying, on that vid, they sent me to uh, Fishkill in 2004. I get to Fishkill in 2004. This is my first meeting. My bid is winding down. I got to make some decisions on how I'm going to move. You know what I'm saying? I'm trying to go home. So as soon as I get to the joint, I run into one of the old homies out of Fort Green. Shout out, salute. Shout out to the homie Bar. I run into the bar. Now, Bar remember me from Green Haven back in 95, 96, little motherfucker. Plus, Bar grew up with my, my, my older cousins out for Green. So, I, he's the first person I see when I get to the jail. And when I see him, he immediately, oh, this little motherfucker here, he immediately makes it his business to win me. Real talk. Listen, though. This is what it is. We keep you out of trouble. Ah, this, that, the third. Bring you down to my uh, organization. Get you rolling with this medium shit. All right, cool. I follow his lead throughout the jail. This is new for me. Joining organizations. Participating in certain programs. Like, all this shit is new for me. But I'm all in because I'm trying to go home. I'm trying to do things different. But it was definitely new for me. And, um... Being a part of that organization, Bar put on some responsibilities on me, like working in certain areas, like the visiting room, taking pictures, and the front gate where the visitors enter, giving out toys and shit or during the holidays. This was new for me. <laughs> this was very new for me to be in these positions and to do these things. He gave me these responsibilities and I took them on. And I enjoyed doing it. But being a part of that organization, every organization within a facility has what you call a staff advisor. The staff advisor is usually a civilian or an officer who oversees the organization. Everything y'all do goes through your staff advisor and your staff advisor gets it Reviewed by the administration for the approval or disapproval. Our staff advisor at the time was a very popular, well known, and well respected female officer. They called her Big O at the time, the boss. She was our staff advisor. So, me coming to Fishkill. Becoming a new member of the organization Of course I had to meet The staff advisor I already got word Who she was How she give it up What she stand for What she don't stand for And I knew my place <laughs> Real talk You know what I'm saying Remember it's One it's my first medium Two I don't know her Three As an officer and staff advisor She's going to know everything about me she has access to a computer. She knew who the fuck I am. She knew why I'm in prison. She all that. So I played my position. Because, you know, a lot of people, you know, a lot of people don't understand the dynamics of my case. So I'm walking on eggshells with a female staff advisor. Cool. Big old boss. We meet. I'm working in the visit, I'm taking pictures, I'm working up front, I'm giving out the toys to the kids, she overseeing shit, I'm playing my position, you know what I'm saying, very little conversation, I don't do too much talking with her because I don't know this person, you know what I'm saying, but all along, she's getting to know me through my moves, the things she, I'm doing, the positions I'm working in, you know what I'm saying, how I'm conducting myself, so now, we 
we have these certain events and shit like that where we all come together for banquets and shit like that, the organization and, you know, she was she was the type of officer where she was truly one of the fellas. You know what I'm saying? She was one of the fellas and she had a reputation of this. She was one of the fellas with a lot of the old older prisoners. But she was like a mother to all the younger prisoners. So she just had she just had this genuine she just had this respect about her in the facility. And if a motherfucker tried to highlight her on some other shit, it was insane in the prison with her. <laughs> Miss O, hell no. Like, you know what I'm saying? You say the wrong thing, your ass get dragged to the box because that's how the officers was giving it up for. Straight jacket. Me, I never crossed those lines. You know what I'm saying? But uh, as time went on and she got to know me, she's picking my brain. And I, I'm not realizing she's picking my brain. I'm thinking she's just getting to know me. But she's picking my brain because outside of the job, she knows my family members. She's doing a full-blown investigation on me because I work for her. But at the same time, the things she's finding out are kind of interesting. <laughs> she finds out that I got family members that do what she do. She got she find out I got family members that she know. So outside, she's doing what she doing. I'm just doing what I'm doing. I'm just working. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't there long with them. You know what I'm saying? But the conversations we used to have as a group were interesting and, they, and very engaging. Like, she used to pick our brains about certain shit. And um, I guess I, I represented myself well in those conversations. I conducted myself well in her presence. And just like I never forgot her, she probably never forgot me. But I'm going to go, I'm going to go, I'm going to get a little deep into some conversations. You know what I'm saying? But um, the conversations when we had one deep conversations where everybody was more or less we was on the banquet and shit, and somebody's uh somebody's girl didn't come, somebody's girlfriend didn't show up, so the conversation was more or less like you know, did did you think the woman love you? Were you in love? Like you know what I'm saying? Because he he because she didn't come he. Zero to a hundred. So sometimes the conversation got to got down to love. Did you love her or whatever? And everybody start chiming in and shit. <laughs> and then once you know you start chiming in, dudes start reminiscing and shit, talking about their first loves and all that other shit. Boom, boom, boom. And I had to, I I came to the senses like, yo, this is what, exactly what I said. <laughs> I was like, yo, I never had a teenage love. This is what I said. I never had a teenage love. I never had a puppy love. Never. You know what I'm saying? Never. I was in some dysfunctional relationships where me and other people conducted ourselves crazily. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I didn't grow in the relationships. More damage was done to me and the other person mentally. Trauma, once again, it goes back to trauma and shit like that. You know what I'm saying? When you're raised in a certain environment, you conduct yourself a certain way. You know what I'm saying? And I could never say I had a teenage love. I'm still waiting for mine. That's what I said that day. I'm still waiting for my teenage love. So now everybody like, but you, we grown ass men, how you still waiting for a teenage love? I'm still waiting for a teenage love because I've been incarcerated since I was a kid. And in my heart, I still need my teenage love. That's why I named this segment Teenage Love. Because we had that conversation on teenage love. And I'm telling you, bro. That one conversation. It sparked something between me. And the staff advisor, Big O. She never said nothing to me. I never said nothing to her. Because like I said, I knew my place. And I wasn't going to be rude and disrespectful. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't going to do that. I wasn't going to do that. So, I left an impression on him. I was only in that facility for a year. I left. Get to another spot. 
take my shoe on the road. I'm moving around the state. Couple bullshit tickets in and out the box. This is the time when my family is calling me can't get right. Because I'm getting closer and closer to this parole board. And it seemed like the closer I'm getting to this parole board, the little shit is, is happening that's like fucking my bit up. So at this time, my name is can't get right with my family. So I ends up in from medium back in the max. Now I'm going from a max transfer to another max. I'm going from Windy 06 to Shawonga 07. I get to Shawonga in 07. Yeah, I left fit. I was in Fisk in 04. I left in 05. I was there for a year. It's 07 now. I'm in Shawonga. I get to Shawonga. All the old heads is there. Everybody I started the bid with from the early 90s. Because everybody's winding down on their bed, man. Everybody got these motherfucking 20s and 25s in it. You know what I mean? I'm bringing them 16. It's 07. I'm going to my first parole board in a less than a year. And I'm bringing them 16. So everybody's there. <laughs> I never forget. I'm walking through the hallway. I see, I see, I see money. Salute. Salute. Money just kicked down the door. That 31 years, they finally let the brother go. Salutes. Welcome home. I see money. He, I think he was working in the IOC or some shit. I see money. Yo, what up? He like, yo, I saw your name on the chain sheet. Yo, yo you going in the cell with Rodmel. Shout out my comrade and big brother Rodmel from Queens. I just spoke to him yesterday. I got to plug him in with Jiggy Jeff. Rodmel's my big brother. He like, yo, you going in the cell with Rodmel. I'm like, word. He like, oh, man. <laughs> I'm like, what happened? He like, y'all niggas going to fall out. I said, nah, that's my nigga. We could double bump. The fuck? It ain't that bad. He like, man, okay, but y'all about to fall out. Basically, he letting me know, I don't give a fuck how much y'all love each other. Y'all gonna get tired of each other. Y'all two personalities? That's what he basically telling me. Man, fuck that. I'm going to sell with my boy right now. <laughs> so I go on the block. <laughs> They tell me what cell I'm in. I go up to sell right now. in the cell. Set open. He, oh, shit, yo, fruit. Oh, shit, yo, what up? We happy to see each other. I ain't seen this 2007. I ain't seen Ramel since. 96, Green Haven. So we happy to see each other and shit. Money ain't never lied, boy. <laughs> Me and that nigga was happy to see each other for 24 hours. After that, oh my God. Oh my God. That's my big brother, and I love him to death, boy. But he drove me crazy in that double bunk shell. And I drove him crazy. Oh man, we was up in that motherfucker arguing and fighting every day. That was my God, boy. But I say that to say, I was living in the cell with my man. And one morning, early in the fucking morning, man, had to be about 8 o'clock, 8.30. I'm still fairly new in the jail. I only been in the jail. Four months or less. So I'm still, I'm still fairly new to this shit. You know what I'm saying? I sell crack visits. Fuck, you come to see me this early in the morning. But like I told you, you know what I'm saying? I got family on the job or whatever. I never know when they gonna pull up. And they in the facility they worked in wasn't too far from me. So I don't know what the fuck they expect. I just know it's early in the fucking morning. 8, 8, 15, 8, 30, barely visit. What the fuck? So my man right now, like, what the fuck is that? I'm like, I don't know. I go down to the visit. Yo, son, visiting room is empty. It's early in the morning. <laughs> it's only one person sitting in the visiting room. I walks out. Oh, shit. So the police are like, all right, that's your visit right there. And I'm f fucked up. It's Big O, the boss. 
I'm like, yo, what are you doing here? Because the first thing going through my mind is, don't you work for these people? <laughs> she like, nah, I'm a civilian. Excuse me? I'm a civilian. <laughs> I came to check on you. <laughs> Straight jacket. Hey, fuck me up, bro. Sat my ass down. And she walked me through some things. She told me some things. She opened me up to some things. She broke me down and told me who I was and what I needed, what she saw in me, what other people failed to see. She chose me, bro. Fuck me up. She said, yeah, you said you never had a teenage love. You got one now. Straight jacket. Now, we get to reminiscing. We talking. Now we can have the conversations we wanted to have, but we couldn't have because we weren't crossing no boundaries. So now we having these conversations. So, I tell her who I am, what I'm about. I give her my life history, everything. Guts and glory. She already know the family. Fucked me up when she dropped that one on me. Yeah. I, ooh, ooh, family. Yeah. Did my homework. Fucked me up. Okay. She know the family. Now you gotta be, you gotta know Big Mama. Checkmate. Put that work in. Like, oh shit. I've never had a woman Sealing all these corners like this. Like, she's letting me know she want to be with me. For real, for real. Like, and you know what I'm saying? This is a person who knows me for me today. Not a person holding on to some past fake ass reputation. Some fast ad, some fit, oh, you know, none of that shit. This is a person who's getting to know me today, who's helped building me. Yeah, she was molding me into the man she wanted me to be. And I didn't fight her. I didn't resist. Straight jacket. You understand what I'm saying? And that's when it was not only a teenage love. Because it was beautiful, bro. The nigga was smitten. Like I said, she was a civilian. And what she meant by that was, I'm a civilian. I am retired. I'm a civilian. Like, I don't work for nobody. <laughs> like, I can live my life type shit. Word? Yeah. So what do you do every day? I'm going to do this every day. What? Yeah. Papoose tore that door down for Remy every day in the visit. Salute to Miss Sunny Bailey. She did the same thing for Big Fruit and she won a correction decision. She had to. She had to get to know me on a personal level now. And she did that shit by walking through that visiting room every day. I kid you not. I did the visiting room six days a week. Every day. Getting to know Fruit. She taught me who the fuck I was. Real talk. Like, it became recognizable to me that she was not only my air light, but she was my godsend. And she was saving my life, bro. That's why the next segment will be the queen that saved my life. Because I'm telling you, son, this woman came in my life and she was the one who told me that I dealt with trauma. She was the one who taught me that I was dealing with PTSD. And know how she taught me these things? She had to teach me who she was. And her life story blew me the fuck away, son. 
Her life story, yeah, y'all gonna get that too. Her life story blew me the fuck away. And I'm like, yo, wow, people need to hear that. You can save a lot of young girls' lives. So that's coming. That's coming. We the real deal here, bro. That's coming. But she had been through so much. Plus, mind you, she's older than me. My wife got me by about four and a half years. So she's a little more, you know, women are more, a little more uh, educated. Or, should I say uh, faster than men educationally anyway. You know what I'm saying? Not to mention that she's already older than me. So, plus her life experiences. She experienced shit that I didn't. So, life moved faster for her. So, she was schooling to me my, to my childhood trauma. Like, yo, that's childhood trauma you got. Like, you got daddy issues. Like, you got mommy issues. Don't feel no way because other people have them too. Like, I never heard these things until I met my wife. You dig what I'm saying? I'm so used to... To these motherfucking dysfunctional people and these dysfunctional relationships, this normal relationship is blowing me away. I, I'm incarcerated, so that's the only abnormality. I'm not home with my woman, but yo, bro, this woman walked with me, bro. She walked me through it. Yeah, man. Yo, it was a beautiful process, man, because I grew and matured so much with this woman, man. I began to know my self-worth. Yeah, real talk. You know what I'm saying? I began to evolve as a man. I was no longer a, a boy, and I was no longer just a male. M-A-L-E. I was no longer just a male. This woman... Helped me become a man. There's differences between males and men. You know what I'm saying? And the same thing with women. You got a lot of uh, females that aren't women, bro. They conduct themselves in a certain manner. They talk in a certain manner. Like, that shit is cool. Ain't none of that shit cool. You got to conduct yourself like a woman. She taught me what to look for in a woman. She taught me how women conduct themselves. Like, this is how a woman conduct herself. My, 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 my wife taught me that. This is how a queen conduct herself. This is how a queen talk in public. My wife taught me all that. And you a king, nigga, and you gonna do the same. So, it was my wife who was building me up, bro. Like, you will never see my wife in public just... Oh, no. Nah. Nah, and she ain't gonna let me go out like that neither. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, man, it was my beautiful wife, man. Yeah, when she, she kicked down that door, she said, yo, you ain't never had a teenage love. You got one now. Yeah, that shit remind me of the movie, uh, 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 Norbert. <laughs> you got a girlfriend. <laughs> you do now. Yeah, man. Work the bugger. Yeah, man. Shout out to, shout out to Sonny Bailey, bro. Yeah, and Pat Poos. Those are two people I knew did that shit. My wife was coming to that motherfucking visiting room every day getting to know me till she was like, you know what? You ready to do this? I'm like, do what? She like, nah, nigga, I got you. Let me walk these dogs. I got you. Nah, they, they let this one get away. <laughs> Word, you feel like that? Yeah, they let this one get away. I'm going to wrap you up. And she did. She did. She wasn't playing. She wrapped me up, son. She was my God, son. The best thing that ever happened in my life, son. I kid you not. When I was doing that time, man, she would make her trips to New York. And they said my grandmother would have the biggest smile when she would show up. She was a reflection of me, right? Now, when you listen to the uh, story of Loso, when I maybe first, 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 first ever had an encounter where I met my wife eye to eye, face to face, and I was smitten. I was so smitten by her. When you go back and listen to that tape, you will hear me say, 
Her name was Big Ange in the hood. On the job, she was Miss O. Hell no. <laughs> I changed my wife's name, bro. I thought that was so sweet. Because my wife brightened my days, man. My dark days. She gave me that light I needed, man. She shined that light on me at all times. She always kept me on the stage. She always had the light on me, no matter what. She always had my back. Like right now, I'm going through a bunch of bullshit. She got my back. It's me and her against the world. You feel me? She got my back. But yeah, I changed her name to Sunshine. Yeah. Because my favorite song in the world was dedicated to her by Alexander O'Neill, Sunshine. So the Sunny is shortened for Sunshine. So the world knows my wife as Sunny because that's a nickname I gave her. And I just thought that was special. You know what I'm saying? I named my wife Sunny. She's my sunshine. And my family used to tell me how my grandmother used to light up when she used to see her. My grandmother was getting old. You know what I'm saying? She was coming of age. She was passing away. And um, my, my wife used to just put a smile on her face to her dying day, man. So she's going to forever be my sunshine. That's why her name is Sunny. Real talk. Yeah, man. So, there you have it. There you have it. A teenage love. Yeah. A teenage love. Mm. Yeah. A teenage love. So, I'm in Shawanga Correctional Facility getting to know my first teenage love. And it, it, it is cool. I ain't mad. <laughs> I ain't mad at all. You know what I'm saying? It took a long time to get one. But I ain't mad. You know what I'm saying? But, uh. A teenage love eventually turns into the queen that saved my life. And that's what I'm going to give y'all next. On episode 6. The incarceration of Fufon. The queen that saved my life. Because my wife my wife came through that door. We was doing them visits every day, every day, every day, every day, every day for a few months. Next thing you know, she was like, yo, it's time to do what we do. I'm going to bring you home right. You getting ready to go to the parole board. I'm going to bring you home right. Yeah, I'm gonna bring you home right. So now this is where we end episode five, a teenage love. Cause I'm about to take a big step in my life and a big step in my journey with this incarceration. Yeah, episode six, the queen that saved my life. We talking about marriage and we talking about parole boards. Yeah, so y'all stay tuned cause episode six is coming. And this episode 5, I'm going to drop right now. Y'all know I don't play with it. I push the drop button in a minute. Salutes. So